Welcome to Turnright Machine Works. My name is Keith. And today we're starting on a new project. Uh, th this project actually has been in hand, has been in the shop here since October, November when it first came in. But we had to go through making up our minds uh, uh, what they wanted to do before I could get started on this. And <clears throat> what this is, is that we're going to be making the third set of rudders for this vessel. This is a uh, twin, uh, 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 twin screw cat boat and originally the rudders were cast bronze and then they were hacked up and then they were glassed over and shaped into a foil shape and then this one was hit and this one here is pretty well cracked up uh, water getting in between of the laminate and expanding and, and creating uh, a failure. But this one here still got pretty much its size of design that they want. We are going to change a little bit of the foil shape and that I have drawn out on the plasma cam already to specs. But what we're doing right now is we're creating, I, this, is, this is my bar that holds my patterns for the tracer unit and we're getting ready to machine the shaft that's going to go down into the rudder and I want to because it's going to be a series of ribs in the rudder here and each one of those ribs is going to pass through and I have a design of shaft that I want to go ahead and set it up so that each one of those ribs is going to intersect the shaft at a certain height and will be welded in there and they'll all be supporting the skin of the foil shape. So what I'm doing here just to start off <clears throat> and I want to find a ratio of what's in front of the the center line of the shaft to what's out the aft of the shaft. Standard flat blade is usually a general rule of five to one uh, and, and I want to go ahead and calculate the the design thinking behind what was put in on this glass rudder here in determining the shape and <clears throat> and taper and size that I will be modifying the foil shape to become the rudder shape itself. Um, so we're going to take, this is just eyeballing down here, this is the center of the shaft, center of the shaft here, and this is just to give us a somewhat straight line here of the center of the shaft protruding down through here. Alright, now we're going to go ahead and I want my webs to be about six inches apart here. So there's going to be, besides the top and bottom, there's going to be three intermediate um, wedges in here. So the distance or the amount of ratio in front and behind, in front and behind, I'm going to figure those out right now by taking this overall here and dividing in the center of the forward section of the split line. And we're going to find out the ratio that we have right here. Now the first, first one here, we're going to call it 15 inches. Actually, right, so you want to get real, yeah, I'm, gonna, I, I'm still going to say 15 inches. This is kind of rounded off of here, and I know that the uh, the rudder that I'm, I'm going to be creating is going to be more true foil shape. Okay, 15 divided by 3.65. Equals four, four point. Okay, we got four point one four. Now we got here. We got uh, fourteen and a half divided by three. Four point eight four. Thirteen and a half divided by. Two and a half, five point four zero, 
So they're not really consistent. Let's just go ahead and we'll take this up here. 15 and almost four. Let's just see what that would be here. 15, three point seven five. All right, so we're gonna find a medium range in here and this ang leading edge angle here, and we're gonna kind of put two and two together and figure out our actual foil shape. So right now, we're gonna go ahead and we have our, our drawing for our pattern to create the lower half of the shaft. We'll leave this to the diameter till we're ready to turn it around and turn it for this, this diameter and a square at the top. And that this pattern right here now is in the plasma camera ready to cut. So let's go ahead and reset up and we'll go ahead and create the pattern that will bolt to this bar. Uh, I have slotted holes so that we have a little bit of longitudinal adjustment uh, when it's bolted to here to help us set up in the lathe to where we want to go uh, up against the shoulder here. Okay, we've got the table blocked off with our drapes, uh, heat blankets to keep the airflow right and we're pretty well set up in the in the area. We're going to be cutting our piece right out of that strip down the middle which is a narrow piece. Now on the screen here we actually have it drawn out here and you can see this is going to be the the bottom of the rudder here and we're not sure quite what we're doing but we're just going to leave it straight and at that length right there. This will be the first shoulder and I'll zoom in here so this is radius up here for strength and this is a shoulder where our web, foil shaped web on the inside of our rudder is going to be placed and uh, we're able to weld out fillet back here and then the top of it is radius back in. This is just a slot to hold our jig in place. And we'll step up to the next one here. You can see the same thing. We've designed each one of them to be exactly the same. Now up here at the top, we know that it's going to be flanged, but we just left this straight on the outside so that we can create a cut out here that's not going to be coming back down into our actual stem diameter. So it'll be radius up here, and then this is, should be, this is where the top plate will flange out, and then there'll be a slight angled weld in here. We might even do a reverse prep in here because the the rudder that we have here for a sample actually has a uh, like a flange where it wears or bearings and uh, we just kind of have this shape right here because it'll give us the most material right now for this area right here. We're kind of contemplating on what's going to be in here and right now it kind of just comes out here and leaves the material on the shaft so that we can get that diameter right there. So I think we're pretty well set and we're just going to bring this in here like this. Let's get some draft in here and then we're going to be starting our cut.
clean up on that. Our cut looks really nice. The reason why we cut both sides is we weren't sure we would have a better edge one way or the other way and if we had to we could actually flip this thing upside down and this would be a definite, uh, uh, the, the, the mirror image of what we actually cut on this side here. But this really does look good. I'm going to let it cool down a little bit and we're going to clean the dross off and we're going to go ahead and get in there and start setting up our machine operation for the lower part of our stem. Alright, so we're going to let this cool down for a little bit and we're going to hold it up to the rudder, get a good eyeball on it before we actually take it in there and uh, then we'll get going. We went ahead and lightly dressed it on the back side and the front side. We didn't do anything with this edge at all right here. This is, we're going we're gonna to let this run right in our lathe, right as the pattern and we can, we can see center line right down through our slots right here and this is going to be our flange diameter right up the top there and this is right about flush at the bottom here right about there a little bit a little tiny bit extra we're going to have that skin coming off of here we're not quite out we're going to attach this one but there's our rib there one rib's going to be actually right there one's going to be right there and one right there just about where our marks are that we uh, freehand on there real quick all right let's go get the lay set up have some fun. Yeah, it's starting to cool down now. We don't need our gloves. All right, and uh, we just wanted to set this on here real quick before we head in there. And it looks like we're right on the money. On the, of course, we set those all up in the mill a long time ago and set them all up exactly at four inch. And that's what I put in on the drawing for cutting these slots out. And we have a little bit of leeway side to side, probably oh I don't know, maybe twenty, thirty thousands and we got three quarters of an inch of travel this way here actually a little bit less because uh, the slot is three quarter long so uh, half the diameter of the uh, quarter twenty up you know away from that so at least five eighths of an inch of travel okay we're just gonna face and center drill this real quick and then we'll be able to slide it out and support it with our center and then we'll go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and give you a good description and, and a once over on the tracer attachment here so that you can see how every part of the function is on the tracer attachment plus how the tool bit and all of that mounts in and the different positions that you can go in. A more in-depth uh, introduction to my tracer attachment. <laughs> We've had this in here and we pulled it out to take it in the other room and now we're going to put it back in here. We've used this on a couple jobs here recently so the centers are pretty well set up. Our jig lays on there. Now this spins in, in, in here. The weight holds it down but I don't like coming across it and putting pressure and stuff on it um, in this mode so I, I wanted to make it more stable so the, what I designed <coughs> was a piece of round bar that actually mounts or sits right into that groove right there and I take a C-clamp because I never know where I want to put this thing but I normally have it back here so I'm going to grab my C-clamp real quick and we'll clamp that up and that automatically holds it square and keeps it from rotating all right, now that we have this mounted in between the centers and from rotating, now we can play with our jig, okay? And I, I didn't have half inch length uh, cap screws. I just had one inch. So I put nuts and lock washers on here and that's how I'm holding this down. It's not that it's critical. And I put this mini in here because if you have a long skinny pattern and you need to put a bow in it because maybe, maybe the heat 
created a warp or whatever on, on my pattern or I needed to adjust it, fatten it up a couple thousands here or there or steer it, I've got play and room to do that. So that's kind of the plan here. Now that I've got the pattern in here, I need to go ahead and start setting up the tool that I want to use and bring my material down to the position where I want it uh, to be machined at and set the overall length and the pattern and the stylus foot all in the tool bit up here all in, in relative matching form so that what's being cut down here is in the right position to where my tool bit is up here in re regards to the part itself. So let's go ahead and I've got to slide this out to where I know I got uh, working room. I'll put the tool bit in and I'll show you a little bit about that and then we're going to come back here and then we're going to start adjusting the slide here uh, in the pattern itself to time it exactly right with our part. We may be adjusting the part, we may be adjusting the bar, we have centers that we can slide back and forth and we can also slide our pattern back and forth. So we got a little bit of adjustment in those three rounds there. Okay, the tracer attachment is powered by this hydraulic power supply here. And this is wired into the lathe, uh, and it's also a three-phase unit to match up <coughs> the, uh, the lathe power. Now, I don't have a little dolly. I often thought about putting this on a dolly and rolling it around, and I also thought about setting up uh, <coughs> longer leads and everything else. Some people, you know, are worried about my cracks in the rubber hose there. Those were in there when I got the lathe back in... Uh, uh, the beginning, end of 94, the beginning of 95, somewhere in that ballpark range there. Pretty much I, I did wash this down and uh, cleaned out the sump and everything else uh, when I first got this thing. And it, it does, it's, it's dusty and dirty and everything else like that. I do lift it up. It has a twist uh, clean for the, uh, the filter. Um, the gauge was broken from day one. It does show me... Uh, PSI but not the true PSI because it starts out at it starts out at 500 uh, and then and then goes up from there um, <clears throat> but it does show me that it is working and uh, it's it's switch box is pretty old but uh, it's just turn it on and turn it off all right so we got it on and that's pretty much what powers this whole thing and it's a constant power supply of hydraulics and then the slave cylinder up there at the top tells that cylinder what it needs or doesn't need and then this motor supplies that pressure to control that. This cable here is just from my electrical coming from my lamp here and I kind of like let it hang right in these hoses right here and it stays free and it can move and everything is comfortable and it stays just like that so that's why this wire is laying right here in, in this position here. This is the handle to control the taper attachment to come in. And it's just a lever itself. It has a little ball detent here and it pushes this arm right here. And this arm, this is the manual control for all the way back. But when the handle is put down and, and the stylus is able to come in against your part, and it doesn't take too much pressure to control that right there but that is what actually controls the hydraulics to be shifting inside the cylinder that controls your in and out and it's pretty firm I mean, it can handle a lot of tool pressure and not not deviate from the actual dimension that it's supposed to be taking from tool pressure uh, d dimension you know I mean if you do have a super dull bit and everything else it is going to restrain it's going to push just like if it was on your compound over here on this side here it would still be pushing against your lead screw and everything else well it does the same thing on this side here but it is it's more positive than you think it would ever be and it's and it's as easy as that amount of pressure and that's what controls the direction that this thing flows in now, if I crank my tape, I'm, I'm cranking the compound in and out. This angle right here is set up so that it approaches and it can do slight facing maneuvers. And it's minimized so that when, like on the pattern here, I have a couple reverse curves or curves on the back side or sweep in after the cut. Okay, I'm going to run a DNMP, which is pretty, pretty sharp point, so that when 
it goes past and it's coming on that back side of that curve there's some relief behind here in the scutter and it'll be be able to handle that reverse curve on the back side um, so that's basically the basics as far as what actually controls this in and out and this is your manual manual control and you also your manual get it out of your way uh, lever all right I was editing the video and I noticed when I was showing you the control of this arm right here and or how the finger was touching down here I didn't show you that in fact this arm and linkage connects through this little bore right here and it has this arm here which that arm comes up and actually pokes a little slate uh, inside there is a little spool valve and when this lever moves back and forth it's controlling that spool valve which is actually a slave control for the fluids coming into the block okay and you can see you can see the other end of that spool valve is there that's one of the things that I really took apart and really cleaned up really well and made sure that that was functioning and by cleaning that up and making sure that that spool valve runs real smooth is how I'm able to make this tracer work without vibrations and chatter or at least minimize all of that um, old myth that a lot of people uh, gave tracer attachments because they don't maintenance them and uh, they didn't you know change the fluids and clean the filters and and uh, a lot of things like that all right let's get back to the regular program I just I wanted to come out and actually grab a little footage to actually show you that that was this was controlling a spool valve that controls the flow for the main cylinder in here and the control is all there so really now it said it with it being as simple as that we just got to put the tool bit in here and we're gonna I'm gonna swing you around so we can talk a little bit about my tool post and what I've done to uh, control a couple different positions and why it's not so it's not so necessary to have a fancy uh, tool holder on this just a block holder and everything stays on center because we're using all the same kind of tooling on it okay this tool block here I've got the nut off already and I'm gonna go ahead and do a little wiping down under here anyway make sure there's no chips and stuff I've milled out a couple different products, pockets here. It had this hole and this hole here originally, and it has two pins uh, holes in the in the base here as well uh, for its location. And I, uh, when I do marine shafting, I have an angle that I like to approach this, and I use the regular uh, uh, CNMG there, and <clears throat> it sits about that angle, and and I do my marine shafting. Now, because I'm going to be coming into some sharp corners and everything else, I am going to run it in a straight uh, position here. And usually, once you, once you create your setup there, this tool stays just like um, in that position at all times. To put these one inch holders all on center it takes one shim and I've had this shim ever since I started from day one and I lay that shim on there now I'm able to lay my tool bit in here and it's perfectly square and it's hundred percent on center and this is a piece of high-speed steel actually this is a real oldie here this is a Momax 7 8 by 1 and an 8 tool bit and I, I have used it over the years. It does have a couple radiuses I cut into it. This side I never did touch. It, it was broken off. Somebody whittled it down into some kind of a, a boring bar. But for most of its life, it has lived right there. And then I just tighten this down with the crescent. And that's where you run it. The rest of it, all your adjustments are all in your setup of, of your slide and your jig and your material. 
So that's why you really don't need a big fancy toolbox uh, back here, just like uh, the Aloris I got there, or you know any of your other your, your other quick change tools, because you don't use quick change tools back here as much as you uh, you do out there on that end there. Pretty much, this is following a pattern. This tool bit stays the same from after your setup. I got this light twisted down so you can see this this position down here on the stylus. And I got this light up here just to kind of give the glow here. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring it in. And you can always, when you're bringing it in, you can always feather it in real slow so that you don't crash down there or down here, depending. Because actually I've been somewhere up here and this stylus was way off the pattern sometimes, you know, just depend on what you're thinking at the time. All right, now we're cranking it up here and you can see see how that curves up there the stylus okay right there is the shoulder right there now we're looking good here I mean we got clearance down on our, our, our uh, truck here uh, with our carriage we're safe in that position uh, stylus is right here it's lined up with our line here but that shoulder in relationship to the end of the shaft really should be about right here so what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and we're going to slide out our, our jig all the way there. We're going to tighten that down and we're going to slide our shaft in until we're comfortable about the position that we're going to be in for the end. Okay, so we're going to slide this this way. That gives us uh, about another quarter inch coming out from the chuck. up and then we're going to line up our line there with our piece of material that looks pretty good now you can always what I do is I crank this in this is the farthest uh, Right there is going to be the farthest part out, but right there is where that wants to line up with our 24, 25 inch line. Okay, that's 25 and an eighth. And I might have just a little tiny bit more. And we can always slide it once we're going. What's beauty about the, the tracer attachment is you can be adjustable in and out after you're running for a while, as long as you don't sneak in and grab more material on one of your surfaces, that's going to matter for your sliding. Okay, so if you're way oversized and you're still you're in good position before you get down to size, lots of times you can slide the piece back and forth slightly to to uh, get get comfortable where you want to be. All right, now we're going ahead. We're happy there. We're going to bring in our center. I'm straddling the the tailstock, so I don't want to move it right the second. And I'm going to slide that down in there and then we're going to move the carriage all the way back this way here. We're going to see the introduction where it lines up with the, uh, the end of our shaft here. Just double checking everything here. Okay, we're in here in the center. Alright, now let's go ahead and we're, we're going to leave it out, but we're going to crank down here to the beginning. Ease it in. Okay, that's such a small diameter, we're gonna have to crank this back out. This is there again, you want to make sure that you're going through all these motions before you actually rotate it. Uh, because you don't want to be coming into it live or crash it. Alright, there's there's the end of our shaft right there. Just a little bit off of the part here. We really should be somewhere right around in there. All right, we're going to check and see if we can jack our our points, which would be just loosening up this one here. 
tightening up this one here. I'm just reaching over the lathe because I can do it. You can see how it's moving it. It's progressing this surface over here close to the stylus. You have about an inch of travel in these these centers if you if you get it set up right. <coughs> touch off and this this is your compound coming in and out this is your cut to advance each cut as per pass you, I mean you, you you take a cut and now you want to advance your or you take more on your depth to create your size or size down your part you feed it in with this lever here and this is your compound feed in for the tracer attachment and your zero line is right there, and this is radiance of a thousandth. Each one of these is a thousandth per side. If you move one line, you'll be taking two off the diameter or plunging the cutter in one thousandth on the side. All right. Mr. Pete did a very good video on covering direct and actual dials or radius dial versus diameter dial. It's all the same language, just said a couple different ways, but it's nice to know that there are two different styles of dials on lathes throughout the years. And you should know which one is on your lathe. And this attachment happens to have a direct dial, so it's taking directly 1,000 per side of, uh, of depth of cut. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start off by touching off our part and then given an increment of feed sometimes I like to start out with this uh, about 30 thousandths per side it's almost a sixteenth of an inch off of the diameter at one plunge and then once things are get going and I know where we're at and everything is fine I can crank in uh, just like on my front compound I can I can crank in 50 a side or so um, it, it, this will do everything that the, the regular compound is capable of taking as far as material goes and controlling it with the hydraulics. 